Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to give a talk. Uh, I'd like to thank Nigel and organizers. I really enjoyed this meeting. I've been here for the past three years. Um, there's something missing, though, in uh, posters and many presentations from JGI users and MZL users. Uh, maybe James actually added some of these. Um, we are missing structures. And actually, I am glad I'm not talking to a computer representing your genomes. And I'm talking to your three-dimensional uh, versions. So uh, uh, OK, uh, let me uh, introduce in each first of the, our BR-funded, actually, facilities in structural biology. These are, uh, these are located in a, a light uh, sources and neutron sources in the United States. This is a $5 million, billion investment from the Department of Energy to actually uh, run these facilities. They have, so we have uh, uh, advanced light source, which is right across the bay at Berkeley National Laboratory, advanced photon source at Argonne National Laboratory, where I am located right there, and National Synchrotron Light Source 2 at the Brookhaven National Lab, which was just put together. We have the uh, spallation neutron source and uh, high flux uh, ion reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which is neutron, these are neutron sources, a synchrotron, a Stanford synchrotron um, radiation light source at uh, uh, SLAC, and this free acton laser uh, light coherent light source at, at uh, SLAC. So these facilities can actually provide you with incredible set of uh, uh, techniques, uh, advanced techniques for your research. And um, uh, Amy Swain at BR is uh, organizing the, uh, our sort of working group of all the uh, uh, facilities that are funded by BR. And uh, we are trying to present uh, to all the users uh, and f f uh, people receiving funding from the BR that I could, uh, they could uh, use uh, these uh, various techniques uh, available to you at the light sources and, uh, and neutron sources. And they are being run the same way they are being, like EMSEL is being run or JGI. You can send application and get access to these facilities. So we cover a number of advanced uh, techniques, including crystallography, uh, X-ray scattering, spectroscopy, imaging, neutron scattering, and others. So um, this is sort of list of the that shows spatial resolution and, and sort of ver various timing that can be used in your experiment. So you have a lot of sequence information, and now this sequence information can be enhanced through the using other techniques. Uh, for example, you can do dynamics, you can do X-ray crystallography, you can do cryo-electron microscopy, you can use cryo-electron uh, uh, diffraction, you can do all kind of sophisticated spectroscopy. And you can learn about different uh, 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 properties of your molecules and interactions. Now, uh, Advanced Photon Source is the largest uh, light source in the United States. Um, it has about uh, 60, oh, we are losing, uh, 68 different beam lines. You can see different techniques. The blue actually are biology. There's also material science, geosciences, chemistry, physics, polymers, and you can actually apply for a beam time at the advanced photon source. The structure biology uh, center is sector 19, and next to it there is this uh, new facility that had been put together by us uh, about three years ago. It's advanced protein characterization facility. This facility is actually to produce proteins. So you have genes, you have sequences, we can produce proteins for you. And uh, we can produce thousands of these proteins per year in milligram scale or multi-milligram scale. So you can, it can be done for enzyme characterization and can be done for, uh, for uh, studying interactions. It can do, be done actually for 
uh, functional uh, studies using, uh, uh, let's say, microfluidics, for example, and you can do structural biology as well. So uh, this particular facility is currently hosts Midwest Center for Structural Genomics, the Midwest Center for Macromolecular Research, Center for Structural Genomics of Infectious Disease, and some systems biology programs that are funded by, uh, by BR. So we have all these robotic systems for protein gene cloning, protein expression, protein purification, characterization, and then everything is wrapped by the database. Okay, so I'll give you a couple examples of what you can learn from structure that you cannot learn from sequence. And then I will tell you a little bit about these new systems or actually systems of the social life in bacteria that we described. So some years ago we have determined a crystal structure of alpha glucosidase from uh, human uh, microbiome uh, bacteria that uh, basically 10% uh, of the genome of this bacteria uh, codes for some kind of uh, uh, carbohydrate processing enzymes. And this particular alpha glucosidase is actually very similar to human enzyme. It has active site very similar. When we look at the active site of that enzyme, we found that there was a tryptophan um, and this particular enzyme prefers one alpha 1,6 one glycosylic bond over 1,4. But when we mutated this particular residue, tryptophan 169 to tyrosine, it switched specificity from 1,6 to 1,4 bond. Okay? Now, so you can actually see this activity here. So it turned out when you take now the sequences of alpha glucosidases from that family, in this particular position, there are t always either tryptophanes or tyrosines. So it turned out that the nature is actually using that information already. And when it's needed, it will hydrolyze 1,6, alpha 1,6 glycosylic bond or 1,4 glycosylic bond. Now, we also discover completely new things. This particular protein is the micro, uh, micro cage. And uh, this belongs to potentially fa family of septolysins. And uh, these may be actually toxins uh, that maybe form some kind of pore structures. But we have no idea, even after we solve the crystal structure, we don't know what they do. OK, so here is a little introduction to toxins and interactions. So social life of bacteria. So in their social life, bacteria tend to establish both positive and negative uh, uh, or antagonistic relationships, and uh, basically to maximize their survival. Now, such communication mechanisms are utilized during collaboration. For example, chemical signaling, uh, known as a quorum sensing, um, triggers coordinated activities so bacteria behave like a single or large multicellular organism. And actually, we have determined the first crystal structure of quorum sensing transcriptional factor in complex with homocellin lactone pheromone, this red thing here, and a complex with specific DNA. So again, from the sequence, you get a sequence of the protein, but you have no idea why the thing is being regulated and how. It turned out that the TRA-R protein in Agrobacterium tumefaciens when it's expressed as being degraded. Where only when homocerin lactone shows up in the cell, it stabilizes the uh, uh, monomer of that protein, which will dimerize, and only then it actually binds to DNA and activates genes involved in a DNA plasmid exchange, so all uh, bacteria coordinate their activities uh, using this, uh, this plasmid uh, uh, DNA. Okay, so this is a, a, a sort of interesting picture of uh, microbial communities. Turn out that they contain thousands of toxin genes, and very often these genes are associated with neutralizing genes. And such loci are highly abundant in chromosomes, in plasmids and phages, uh, in all uh, forms of uh, bacterial 
uh, all kind of relieving bacteria. Now this, I call them T toxin, antitoxin slash immunity proteins because we have different nomenclature. So sometimes that we have toxin and antitoxin system, and sometimes we are talking about toxin immunity protein. And, and this is because uh, uh, different uh, in, uh, researchers have a sort of different approach to it. But the, the point actually I'm trying to make that the toxins are very often uh, uh, causing some kind of growth arrest by interfering with essential functions uh, uh, of essential cellular processes and the uh, cognate toxin or uh, in, in, uh, immunity protein will interfere will tox with toxin activities directly or indirectly. So they are using a variety of mechanisms. Now, these processes actually have significant uh, impact on competition within microbial communities, which I did. I've been in these meetings here for several years. I never heard about taking into account uh, you know, this kind of uh, problems like competition within community, B uh, biofilm formation, uh, quorum sensing, program cell deaths, phage defense uh, via abortive infection, plasmic maintenance, or generation, dormancy, or persistence to evade some stress condition like antibiotics, for example. Now, uh, so here we have bacteria, and this is an artistic rendition my grandson of the bacteria here, and uh, let's say this uh, bacteria need to enter this kind of sophisticated um, microbial community that was shown two days ago by uh, Victoria. Uh, now, what this bacteria can expect? What's going to happen? Well, it may need to have some choices based on its genome, and also the genomes and interactions of the uh, community within that you know, complex system. Okay. So uh, one of the examples of uh, this kind of toxin, antitoxin systems are bacteriocins. And these are, uh, and I don't know actually whether JGI, when you analyze your genomes, whether you analyze very small structural genes, because microsin C is coded by seven residue genes. Okay, I, I, and I don't know whether you take into account the genes as long as seven amino acids, but this is actually a very important one because it's used in, in uh, control of other bacteria. So microsin C is this kind of uh, a tiny uh, peptide that is being made uh, and then is being uh, heavily modified by uh, coenzymes coded in this operon. Uh, and it's actually become, uh, uh, when it is now transported into a uh, receiving cell, cells, it needs to be processed by three proteases, so you need an trans external transporter, internal transporter, and three proteases to activate microsin C, and then microsin C is going to very specifically inhibit uh, the aspartyl TNA synthase. Now, we have determined the structure of the immunity protein, which is called this MCCF, and this particular protein belongs to the family of S66 proteases, uh, serine proteases, and is found in many different bacteria, not always those that are associated with microsin C. So the function of that particular enzyme is actually expanded into some other fields which we still don't understand uh, truly. Okay, so let's talk about distribution, how you find these uh, toxins. So if you, um, they very often highly diverge in sequence. So we have, uh, uh, there was a paper just published uh, uh, this year, or last year, sorry, uh, where the, they look for nuclease-based bac uh, uh, bacteriocins in gamma proteobacteria, and they used this hidden marker model uh, to uh, identify over 3,000 different nuclease bacteriocins and they were located on plasmids and uh, on the chromosome of 53 bacterial strains. And you can see their, uh, their distribution here, but the only feature that was conserved was the sequence motif critical for self-killing that is generally not found in bacteriocins that are targeting the periplasm. So very little is being actually common to these toxins. 
Now, in E. coli, for example, there are six classes of toxins, antitoxin systems. And you can see that type 1 and type 3, the antitoxin is actually RNA, which uh, actually interacts with messenger RNA of the toxin. And in type 2, type 4, 5, and 6, the antitoxin or immunity protein is a protein, but the function of it is very different in, in, in these different organisms. Okay, so let's now talk about the contact-dependent inhibition. So this particular system was discovered in 2005. And uh, it is actually uh, this defined as a phen phenomenon by which the delivery of the protein toxin to the cytoplasm by neighboring bacteria upon cell-cell contact. You actually need to have cell-cell contact resulting in a growth inhibition and death. So this is called toxin on a stick. Okay, and I will explain you how this works. Now, this was described, as I said, in 2005 in a rat E. coli strain. That, and at that time, it was assumed that it, the primary function uh, uh, was the eliminating competitor cells. But most, more recent molecular evidence suggests that the, this activity may actually be uh, also to mediate some cooperative behavior among cell cells, a phenomenon that is now called contact-dependent signaling, or CDS. And I'll actually give you uh, three examples of contact-dependent inhibition, um, and then one of them is actually really changing the way the translational process is inside uh, uh, infected or attacked bacteria. Okay, now there is actually limited toxin functionality due, due to several compliance checkpoints. Now you need to have a specific recognition of this uh, of the, uh, the toxin on a stick with the receptor on the, in this case, BAMA or OM, uh, OMCF. Um, you need to have a specific delivery, and we still don't know how the toxin is being cut off the, um, uh, this large protein, CDIA. And then you need substrate specificity inside, uh, uh, inside the cell. And then there are often also required some permissive functions. So for example, the toxin needs to be activated by the host to kill itself. It's sort of interesting concept. Well, um, so the contact dependent inhibition, growth inhibition, we have this uh, sort of, it's actually very widespread um, in, in protobacteria. And it's mediated by this uh, protein CDIB and CDIA, two component system, where CDIB is a, a predicted outer membrane protein that is required to export CDIA, exoprotein. The CDIA is a large 200 to 600 kilodalton protein that it has this kind of repeated uh, structure. We don't have an actual structure, it's just a model for it. And in the end of it, there is a, this toxin thing. There's also this little thing here, which is the, uh, this immunity protein. And in this particular system, all the proteins that in block the toxin action are called immunity proteins. And this is mainly because they block active side of the toxin. OK, so the, uh, this uh, CDI system has been found in eight, over 80 different bacterial species. And they fall into about 30 different families. These families that share typically only 20% sequence, uh, I mean, a sequence identity. And they show very high diversity in terms of toxin activity and activation gene. So you can really recognize the system by CD, looking at CDIA sequence. Now, CDI, uh, uh, the, the, the toxin is called CDIA CT or C terminal toxin which are very polymorphic and also accordingly the they corresponding CDI immunity proteins are also highly variable. So there's low sequence identity between uh, CDI ACT uh, domains and uh, immunity proteins across organisms. So the, the, we, we hope that structures can actually provide additional information. So we have determined many of these. Uh, but I'll give you examples of only a few. So again, 
the CDIA has this um, TPC transport domain and then FHA1 repeats and FHA1, uh, FHA2 repeats. And in the end, we have this pre, uh, pretoxin Venn sequence, which, which in, uh, this is E. coli type. And then in uh, Buhalderia type, we have this QE, LYN sequence. And then in the end of this, we have CT, right? But unfortunately, so we can recognize this Venn motif, but then the toxin can be either some nuclease, but some unknown function. And in this case, actually, it's some kind of peptide that is making pores. So we still don't know. I mean, they can, and they can exchange these toxins between. Uh, and then they have to also exchange the immunity protein because the toxin and immunity protein are really cognate. So they recognize specifically each other. And I'll show you examples of that. So the toxin activities are either DNases, RNases, and can target messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, or tRNA, and they can do an actual pore forming as well. OK, so as I said, we have uh, many structures of these. These are difficult to produce, because if you produce the toxin, you ki it kills E. coli. If you uh, produce complex, but you have too much toxin, it kills E. coli, so you can't really produce. So we have to really co manipulate expression system to get them going. Now, some of them are pretty sophisticated and are linked to other processes. We found four of them that contains metal ions. And these, uh, for example, zinc. This is a complex toxin antitoxin or toxin immunity protein, and they seems to be linked to sensing metal. So they may involve in some other processes as well. OK, so here is first example. So this is a complex of the toxin, antitoxin, from this uh, uh, organism Cobravidus tavanensis. And uh, it's, uh, we, I use the same kind of system. So you have a toxin, and you have an immunity protein. You can see they are very tightly interacting. Um, the, uh, the to and I mark here. Uh, conserve residues uh, in toxin and conserve residues in, in immunity protein. And what actually happened by sequence analysis, they belong to S-type pyosins. And they are found in a number of different bacteria. And um, the, the closest sort of sequence homolog will, is colicin E3 and was identified at the hom homology level of 9% only, so very low. Now for immunity proteins, they are sharing uh, uh, more uh, 30 to 40 percent sequence identity, and H8 PRET analysis recover alpha helical herpin repeats and uh, with about 30 percent sequence identity. Now, here is the complex, right? So, the complex uh, you can see in the complex the conserved residues from toxin interact with conserved residues in immunity protein. And you can see this, this high complementary of surfaces and charge. So this is the immunity protein, this is toxin, and, they, when they, and you flip them by 90 degrees and you form this kind of very tight complex. Interestingly, immunity protein provides this beta strength to complement the structure of toxin. So this all can't be really predicted from, from, the, from the sequence. Now, um, when we actually use these uh, structures to uh, help uh, scientific community to, to try to predict and model novel structures. So we submit these structures to something which is called, called CASP prediction competition. It happens every year. So we submitted it to CASP 12 uh, prediction competition. And only two groups there are over 30 uh, groups, international groups, trying to predict these proteins. Only two groups were able to come out with the model for the toxin. Uh, but uh, more than half were able to model uh, uh, the immunity protein. But none was able to model the complex of toxin with immunity protein. So there is a still huge requirement, you know, how we uh, 
uh, improve algorithms to be able to predict, predict complexes. And these are not large proteins. I mean, the toxin is only 96 residue. And the immunity protein is sort of, e is sort of easy because it exists in sort of many different for forms in protein data bank. OK. This is the second example. Second example is even more striking. We have toxin in green, an antitoxin uh, or immunity protein. Again, very tight interaction between two of them. And the toxin is actually structurally similar to ribonuclease A. Now, ribonuclease A was only found in eukaryotes. And here we have an example of the, uh, of the bacterial protein that is very similar to angiogenin, human angiogenin, and R ribonuclease A from mouse. And you can see the overlap. So here is discovery of ribonuclease A's in uh, uh, bacteria, which has never been, could never be identified. Probably it's called like a hypothetical protein or protein of unknown function. And uh, our collaborator actually showed that this, in fact, degrades RNA. And it's also it also hydrolyzes cyclic CMP. So it is showing like a true ribonuclease A. And there is a family in bacteria, in archibacteria. So they are widespread. And uh, what's happening is this particular protein does not have characteristic disulfide bridges that are found in eukaryotic ribonuclease A. And uh, so it's a, it's, it's a paralog, uh, but uh, it, it doesn't have the same kind of structural feature, and basically no sequence similarity. So uh, um, that's how you structural actually can provide you uh, with uh, some additional information about uh, these proteins. Now, here is the third example. And this is uh, uh, interesting because in this particular toxin, uh, immunity protein utilize host factor. And in this case, we have little toxin here, immunity protein uh, in green, and elongation factor TU in blue. And this trimer forms a dimer with another trimer, so it's a, a dimer of trimers. And uh, this is an inactive version, so this involves immunity protein, so the toxin is not doing any damage to the cell. Okay? Um, now, the immunity protein actually consists this kind of uh, four helix bundle. Uh, here is a better example of that. So that's the immunity protein. That's a little toxin here, and that's the elongation factor. And you can see, again, the toxin and uh, immunity proteins, they actually fall together into a really very tight complex. And uh, the toxin is similar to colicin D, BMT, colicin E5. These are all nucleases. Now, but then the function of this protein is to cleave specific amino tRNA. And you can see this is done in strain E. coli 101 and G101. And you can see this particular amino acid TNA is being cleaved. This particular TNA is being cleaved. So there are seven of them. Now, in uh, another strain, this strain only threonin TNA is being cleaved. So, so this particular toxin, when it gets into a NG101 strain, is reprogramming translation of the genes in that particular strain. Okay. Okay. So we model the complex with DNA. We don't have yes yet. This is a sort of summary what uh, I've been sort of talking about. The, the important thing is that the elongation factor is being utilized by the toxin to present uh, amino acid tRNAs. A set of them. They need to have a G in po position four from the three prime end, the, this cleavage cannot be restored by rebuilding tRNA. So it's basically, it kills this set seven, set seven of tRNAs. Okay, so biology rests on macro, macromolecular structures. That's what I'm, yeah. 
It actually conceptually, functionally, and mechanistically. And I give you an example from my own research. Groyel will fund, fold protein inside the chamber. Proteins with completely different fold and sequence will have exactly the same active site. The inhibitor can bind in between two subunits, blocking action of two active sites in a tryptophan synthase for macrobacterium tuberculosis. The water can mediate interaction, specific interaction between protein and DNA. And uh, the crystal structure and cryem structure can actually show the, uh, all the subunits uh, and domains the, of the, these aggregates HSP-104 that actually is involved in, in uh, amyloid uh, solubilization. So uh, I just I want to acknowledge uh, people involved in the toxin project. Uh, Georgi Babnik has uh, um, analyzed a lot of data. Robert Ian Jacek has done a lot of cloning and expression together with uh, Bill Eschenfeld. And Karolina Michalska and uh, Kemin Tan has done uh, all the work on uh, crystal structure. And this was great collaboration with Celia Golding from University of California Irving and Chris Heiss and Dave, David Lowe from University of California Santa Barbara. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>